Welcome to This Is Money podcast. I'm Georgie Frost and joining me and Simon Lambert today is Lee Boyce. And coming up, they think it's all over, but is it? The Bank of England put the brakes on and held interest rates steady. So have we hit the peak? Should you grab a savings fix before they vanish? Will mortgages get cheaper? And are we on the way back to the old normal? Ask Simon. Also today, the ban on sales of new petrol and diesel cars has been moved from 2030 to 2035. So is that it for EVs? And because no neighbourly dispute is too trivial for us to cover, can we put up a tall garden fence to stop the neighbours looking in? Don't forget, you can stay up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by eToro. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by eToro, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing. But first, so the peak or just a pause? The Bank of England held interest rates this week at 5.25% off the back of some better than expected inflation news. But by golly, it was a close run thing. Five to four against the 15th consecutive hike. Some respite for those on track of mortgages at least. Lee Boyce, start with you. What did you make of the decision? I don't think it was all that surprising in the end, uh, actually, Georgie. I think when we had the inflation figure that came out the day before, uh, showing uh, a relative surprise easing at 6.7% rather than the 7.1% that had been sort of widely forecast, I think that sort of played uh, into the hands of, you know, the MPC members that might have been tempted to do what, you know, to, to pause more than put another hike. So I think that it's a decision that wasn't didn't take us all by that much surprise in the end um and the morning of the inflation figures as the day went on it kind of seemed to be more and more apparent that uh, a, a freezing of base rate was was on its way um we've got next decision uh in november we, it's again there's a lot of time between now and november and, and what yeah. might happen but but I, I think i think that um you know that five to four split uh shows you how kind of close uh obviously it was to, to to rising again i think the the general public have got a little bit kind of uh numb uh to, to all these base rate rises you know it's been the consecutive 14 consecutive rises since december 2021 and then people were kind of going oh it's another 0.25 percentage point rise you know it's, it's been going on and on and on and on um and you know we've got things like mortgage rates have kind of been a little bit all over the place to be honest i mean we had the mini budget last year which kind of gave a peak to mortgage rates and we had a kind of another peak a couple of months ago now they started to fall back down again that gives home buyer confidence this uh freezing of the base rate this time around might give more home buyer confidence but becoming into a, a time of the year which is historically not that big for house buying anyway uh, because of trying to get over the line before Christmas and over the, before the New Year it gets very tight. Um, and then we've had the, the savings rates element where we've seen savings rates, absolutely, we, we'll talk about this more depth shortly, but you know, we've seen savings rates absolutely rocket in the last year, especially in the last six months and in the fixed rate space. I think it's one of those things. I think once that inflation mm. figure came out, I was kind of thinking, yeah, here we go. This could really be a freeze now. And that inflation figure does come in the backdrop of uh, oil prices have, have been going up close to $100 a barrel. We've seen petrol prices at the pumps, mm. therefore, uh, becoming way more expensive again. So there was this whole talk of that's going to feed in uh, to the inflation figure, given that last August... Uh, petrol prices were were far lower, but even that wasn't enough to nudge it over. Um, but people's personal uh, inflation rate probably feels still quite a lot more than 6.7%, depending on your circumstances. Food inflation, for example, is still in double digits. So there's a lot of factors in, at play, but gut instinct for me was it felt like the right choice this time around. They've got a bit mm -hmm. of time to take stock uh, before the end of the year. Um, you know, could go to 5.5%, but it quite possibly might not. Have we actually reached a peak? I mean, my, my gut instinct says I reckon there might be one more, and I think it might be at the next meeting in November. But as I say, a lot can happen between now and November. Yep, Lee, a lot can happen. It's interesting you said that uh, you think people are getting a bit bored. I can always tell by how many calls I get to appear on radio. They've sort of been dwindling. I mean, what else can you say? Oh, here we go. It's another rise. It's another rise. Um, Simon. Yes, the uh, inflation figures were 
unexpectedly better, I suppose, than we thought that they might be. But, you know, reading in that, airline prices are one factor. Did the Bank of England, the Monetary Policy Committee, really just sit around and think, oh, well, hang on, inflation's dipped lower than we thought. It's now 0.1% less than it was last month. Therefore, let's not raise interest rates again. There's a whole load of other factors that they're thinking about. So, I mean, is it really to that sort of knife edge, the figures that came out the day before? No. There you go. That's the answer. No. No, they've got... What else are they looking at? There's other things that they're looking at. So, and in fact, the Bank of England flagged this yesterday um, in the notes that it put out with the rates decision. What the first thing to to mention, actually, is that it was a knife edge. It was five to four. And that means that the decisive vote came from no other person than Mr. Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, who voted for a hold. Um, So it was him what swung it. Now, that's quite interesting in itself, because uh, Andrew Bailey has been one of the more vocal members of the MPC and of the Bank of England, obviously, as the boss, with the whole thing about wage price spiral, don't be asking for pay rises, don't be giving people inflation matching pay rises when inflation is so high, we have to crack down on this, all that kind of stuff. And as we've talked about before, what the Bank of England monetary policy committee is doing is trying to get inflation back down to the two percent target what it's not doing is trying to get rid of the inflation number that we can see right now because that inflation has already happened it's trying to crack down on inflation in the future and that's where all of these rate rises all of that rhetoric and all of that stuff has come from they're going to have been watching inflation obviously but it's not just that inflation dipped down Um, only by the slightest amount, but also that that happened against the expectation that it was going to rise. So it was expected to go up to just above 7%. That didn't happen. But also there's some key numbers in there. The core inflation, which we've all been talking about over the last few months, that that was what sparked the inflation panic over summer that sent mortgage rates going absolutely sky high and everybody saying base rates going to 6%, base rates going to 6.25%, base rates going to 6.5%. Core inflation has dropped substantially. Core inflation strips out volatile um, energy, fuel, food prices and alcohol and tobacco, which are basically largely tax. And that was 6.2% in the year to August, which was down from 6.9% in July and a recent high of 7.1% in May. 7.1% in May was the freak out number that started the whole panic over the summer. Um, So they're watching that. They're also watching uh, labour market statistics. So, for example, unemployment. Um, They noted that the conditions in the labour market appear to be loosening. Um, They are also looking potentially, and actually they mentioned this in their report, at the money supply. That's the amount of money that's being created in the economy through things like new loans and stuff like that. And that has actually dropped down to not at all, new money not being created. Now, there's some debate amongst economists as to whether the money supply causes inflation or not. But what you can see if you look at that chart and the chart of inflation is a colossal growth in money supply um, through the sort of COVID years, which then was followed by a colossal spike in inflation. And now it's coming down. So maybe that's going to bring down inflation. And they're also looking at the fact that they have raised interest rates 14 times in a row. Mortgage rates had spiked way 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 ahead of the base rate so actually banks and building societies were doing quite a lot of the bank of england's job for them without them even needing to raise rates by that much and they're also looking at the fact that the transmission method for rate rises is a bit broken compared to how it used to work because people are on fixed rate mortgages it takes time for it to come through it's not like in the the old days when people on variable rate mortgages my parents generation you know, tell us all about the double digit <laughs> interest rates, mortgage going up every single month. It doesn't happen like that anymore. But what happens is you come to the end of your mortgage term and then you suddenly get whacked. And people are getting whacked for 500, 600 pounds a month, you know, huge amounts. Um, so it's lumpy, but that is starting to take effect. And I think people's expectations are that the, the, the over the next year, they're not going to be doing as well as they have been. They're not feeling like they're doing very well at the moment. They're tightening their belts. The economy is slowing. And the Bank of England 
feels that this is the right time to pause. But it did state that it might raise rates again. Do you think they will? I don't know. Um, Potentially. I would say watch the inflation numbers, but inflation is almost certainly going to go up uh, in the next month's reading due to the uh, oil price spike leading to higher petrol prices. Mm. So, m- you know, maybe you need to watch the core inflation number, watch all those other things that I was talking about. I think the Bank of England is is looking at the economy going, OK, I d- we don't think that we have triggered a recession but even if we haven't triggered a recession, we have definitely triggered a slowdown. I tell you where there is a massive slowdown as well that is quite vital to this country's economy, the property market, and also in building. Um, there is a huge slowdown in building. If you look at the results of the companies coming through that sell you know, building materials and things like that and their forecasts for the year ahead, they're not pretty. Lee, the things that people really want to know are mortgages and savings the number of people that have got in contact with me at work and said uh what's gonna happen please i don't want to be responsible for this but lee you can be what's gonna happen <laughs> lee <laughs> can, I, can i be responsible can i yeah um well look from from a savings point of view and a, and a mortgage point of view as i was touching on there about the savings um you know base rate and savings rates don't necessarily always go hand in hand. It's not the case that base rate rises, so you know mm. savings rates rise. But I mean that has over time been what what is the case. And at the moment, um, we are in a position where we've had some savings rates that have been beating base rate, um, especially in the fixed rate market. So, for example, that NSNI. Uh, one year uh, fixed account that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago that's still available uh, at the time of uh, this podcast going out uh, at 6.2%. Now, the consensus is for a, a, an account like that is that that might not be around for much longer, um, just given the fact that, you know, we might be at the top of the base rate cycle. Not necessarily, there might be another hike or two. We don't know. We're not entirely sure. Uh, but it is time, I think, really now, if you have been dragging your heels, and I can't imagine there's been many people listening to this podcast that have got savings um, that haven't moved the savings around into better paying deals. But the, the consensus is from experts that these fixed rate savings accounts have quite possibly peaked. Um, so if you're in the market for one, it's probably wise to get one open uh, very, mm-hmm. very soon. Um, there's still some plus six percent rates uh, available out there. And if you want one, uh, get one. Now, it, with easy access, um, we're talking more about sort of five ish percent um, and experts still say they think there's a little bit more room to grow uh when it when it comes to to easy access deals so you might be less panicked but sometimes with these accounts anyway you can open them and you don't necessarily have to fund them uh straight away so don't don't miss out i don't reckon many of our listeners would have missed out because we have been hammering home the message i feel for 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 some time um and just on that note on the on the savings uh rate well we've had a an eight percent rate uh launched this week from from nationwide now the reason why i mentioned that is because that story that we published yesterday on the nationwide eight percent account went absolutely crackers um and people wanted to know about it i should point out here that this is a regular saver uh so it's mm. the headline rate is eight percent but over the course of a year you're not going to get eight percent on your interest just because mm. of the way they work and you can only put 200 quid a month into them but again any listener of this podcast will know that i'm actually a really quite a big fan of regular savers because they are the best way to get into the savings habit so even if you're someone that hasn't got a big pot of cash to move around to go and take advantage of these massive rates eight percent with a 200 pound top limit but monthly sum that can go in well worth it plus nationwide is also offering a 200 crown 200 pound current account switching bonus so well worth it now in terms of mortgage rates um as i say it's been a bit of a roller coaster uh in terms of two-year fixes five before year fixes. You, oh, go, go before you talk about that and i was just going to say before you before you go into mortgages um what's dropped into my email account i know we hammered this last week but i still love the fact that you've got best fixed rate accounts to open now your little notifications just dropped as you were speaking lee Oh yeah, fixed rate right. accounts have hit highs not seen for more than a decade recently, but experts have warned that savers shouldn't expect them to stick around for long. So if you want to know what the top rates are, read more here. 
fabulous what I timing love it, that's that's a, that's a great plug for our savior's alert system again i know i was concentrating about. on what you're saying by the way um, i wasn't just checking my emails it's um it's one of those alert systems uh you know our savior's reporter helen crane is, is is just massively on it and you know we we want to make sure that people that are signed up to that alert system mm. uh are, are kind of well informed and know you know what's happening in the savers market and we've built up a nice little community of savers in that list and you can sign up at this is money.co.uk forward slash alert um get involved uh, is what i would say yeah. we've had a Lovely. massive massive spike in signups uh in recent weeks so well worth doing now we don't have a, we don't no no, no I, that was a that was a good stopping of me georgie thank you very much uh, in terms of mortgage rates we don't have a mortgage rate alert system uh, just because I don't think it'd work in the same way. And that's because, um, well, A, they've been yo-yoing all over the shop. B, you only really hunting for a mortgage if you're about to remortgage or buy a new home. So it's a bit more niche. Also, there's so many different other factors at play, the size of your deposit, the length of the term of the mortgage, all of that kind of thing. But it seems that we are kind of over the hump uh potentially when it comes to mortgage rates we'll mention our friends nationwide again here they they came with a series of cuts uh yesterday now offering uh the cheapest two-year fix only for home movers but 5.44 percent um average five-year fix overall at the moment is 5.63 and the average two-year fix is 6.16 so you're going to get a cheaper deal potentially if you lock in uh for longer at the moment now it's hard to call this a little bit more because it has been kind of all over the shop. One thing I would say is that if you are uh, on your, if you fell up, fallen onto your lender's SVR, um, it might be worth having a look now what's, what's happening potentially. Um, some of the SVRs are plus 8%, uh, which is, which is very, very high. But again, we, we've spoken about this on the podcast. This is, I would say a return to, kind of conditions and levels that people that are not new on the property market would be kind of used to. I don't think there's anything unusual about a five or six percent mortgage rate. It's just that we got used to the really super mega mad cheap mortgages that were out there that many people have taken advantage of um and quite possibly are going to get now when they remortgage a rate that's going to be far higher. But, you know, there's there's other banks, there's other building societies that are launching um, rates under 5%. I think that's quite significant. We've had Yorkshire Building Society at 4.99%. We've had uh, Virgin Money at 4.97%, both five-year fixes. And Nationwide came out of a 4.94 uh, mm. five-year fix. So that just sounds like a lot of numbers that I've just shouted out there. But we're getting to a point where you can potentially, depending on your circumstances, get a mortgage rate below 5% again which I think will be music to the ears of homeowners potentially who are going to remortgage or need to remortgage in the coming years that things might be coming back down. But we had a short lived, I feel like we had a short lived kind of dip before after all of the mini budget madness and we got into the new year and it felt like mortgage rates were coming down and then they sort of started shooting, shooting mm -hmm. up again uh, off the back of that May figure as Simon, the summer madness, the summer, I, I called it um, mortgage madness part two, uh, which is really what it was in the summer. Um, it was a it was a sequel that nobody wanted, um, but let's hope it won't be a trilogy. Nicely, I like that, um, Simon. I, I just I think a lot of people feel in the in the mortgage market at the moment something's got to give. We're already seeing house prices drop, we're seeing mortgage rates eke down a little bit. Are we expecting anything to to give a lot, or is it just perhaps a little bit of eking down? I think there's further for mortgage rates to fall if you look at swap rates for example which are the money market funding cost that heavily influences fixed rate mortgages um they would indicate that two and five year fixed rate mortgages have a bit further to come down you also need to look at banks and building societies and their balance sheets and their appetite to lend banks and building societies balance sheets are pretty good um, they are in a pretty strong financial position um, and they want to make money. They want to make profits. They they want to do mortgage business because mortgage business is profitable. And actually, banks and building societies tend to be more profitable when rates are a bit higher because they can bump up their net interest margins a bit more. And if you dig into the figures 
as we have done in the past, you will see that banks and building societies are making more money off savers and borrowers and the gap in the rates uh, that both of those two sets of people get. It's not just mortgages, you need to look at credit cards as well, overdrafts, things like that. Um, the appetite to lend thing, well, how worried are they about the housing market? That's a quite important factor. There's definitely going to be more appetite to lend and make money at lower loan to values than there is at higher loan to values. Because if you lend to somebody with 40% equity in their home, you don't need to worry so much about what happens if house prices drop 10%. If you lend to somebody with only a 10% deposit, then if house prices drop 10%, that person is only even and they're knocking on the door of negative equity. What has to give in the property market is a is another matter. I mean, I think it's worth noting that people tend to only have a limited amount of money that they can spend each month on a mortgage. And if they can't find any more money to spend each month on a mortgage, and they can't borrow anymore. And the way affordability based lending works is the lender looks at your incomings and your outgoings. And if the cost of borrowing £200,000 has gone up by uh, roughly about £300 um, on over 25 years on a five-year fix compared to what it used to be, then if if your budget doesn't show that you've got that spare £300 a month, the lender's not going to lend you the £200,000 anymore. So they're going to lend you less money. And that means you've got less money to spend on a home and this is taking its toll in the most expensive parts of the housing market, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, which were the most stretched, which had seen the biggest rises in the pandemic boom and have got people taking out the mega mortgages, the, you know, 300, 400, 500 grand mortgages. Um, and in some places, and it's and then some. And, and though there people are not able to pay the same prices as they were for houses and you're starting to see house price cuts. Um, right move said this week is seeing the most asking price cuts since oh, it's either 2009 or 2011 or it was a, for a long time basically mm -hmm. Simon though I want to ask you've been tapping away on your laptop for your latest column the Bank of England may have paused but interest rates and inflation are heading back towards the old normal you say do you want to explain what you're talking about Simon? Yes the old normal What's that? Well, I guess it refers to the new normal, doesn't it? The new normal was the scenario after the financial crisis where the base rate was, for example, slashed to 0.5%. Rates were slashed in the, the Eurozone. Rates were slashed in America. Mortgages were very, very cheap. And you had a scenario where effectively you were borrowing money for free in real terms because the rate that you were paying, the interest rate on your borrowing was below the rate of inflation. And that was the new normal. We needed to get used to it, basically. It wasn't going to change because everybody was so indebted. Com countries were so indebted. The financial system had taken such a beating that rates were going to stay low for a long time. We weren't going back to the old normal of rates. The old normal is probably about 5 to 6% um, base rate on average, sometimes lower, sometimes higher, depends on the picture. We were going to get a new normal where base rate was going to settle around 2%, 3%. And in fact, the Bank of England spent a considerable amount of time under Mark Carney with its forward guidance, warning people that when, when interest rates rose, it would be gentle and uh, planned and subdued and everyone would have plenty of warning and there wouldn't be a short, sharp shock. Obviously, the exact opposite has then happened due to the inflation spike. At the moment, even at 5.25%, the base rate is still below inflation which is 6.7%. But inflation is coming down. The landing might be bumpy. It might go up a bit before it comes down, as we mentioned. But inflation is definitely on its way down. Economists reckon it could be below 5% by the end of the year and that it will then keep declining towards the 2% target through 2024. Now, there is a big question as to what happens after that, but that's not what we're talking about right now. That inflation line is coming down and the Bank of England and central bankers across the world have made it clear that they're not planning on bringing that interest rate line straight down either. What we're more likely to see is what was referred to the other day as the, the table mountain scenario um, where it goes up and then it stays there. And then eventually 
it will start to come down when they need to. But having had the scenario where they were accused of being massively behind the curve, um, they totally missed the boat on inflation. Central bankers, I think, are looking at the silver lining to that cloud and saying, well, actually, do you know what? We've had to do this. We've had this rude awakening, but we have got ourselves back to the point where in not too long, rates are going to be back above inflation. Let's try to stick there. Let's try to use this as an opportunity to get back to the old normal. The old normal also included wage rises being higher than inflation, something that, you know, the financial crisis era again bust and we haven't really seen real wage rises in this country for a very very long time so if we could get back to that that would be a good thing if we get back to a point where you know unfortunately really bad news for anybody who's got a big mortgage and needs to remortgage it'd be bad news for me when my five-year fix comes up for example um but if we get back to a scenario where mortgage rates are around the kind of four five percent mark that, that will keep a lid on house prices it means that we won't see the rampant house price inflation that we've seen in recent times and it will bring houses back to a more affordable level compared to wages which if we can get wages to be going up more than inflation and everyone to be getting a little bit richer we get ourselves back towards a position where the economy is on a much better footing because yes mortgage rates have been super low and we've been able to fix for five years at 1.4 percent and all these things but the past you know however many years and the, and the bit before that, after the financial crisis, they've not been very good, economically speaking, for the British population. They haven't been very good, economically speaking, for most people around the world. So it would probably be better if we did get back to the old normal and then stick there. Voice. You know, I love a good philosophical question. It seems that whenever we have these moments, to which I... <laughs> understatedly cool things like you know financial crash etc there is a sort of drive that we compare it to getting back to how things were and I'm just wondering whether you think reflecting on the last few years the last few decades maybe are there lessons that we could learn particularly when it comes to the housing market that you would really like not to go back that actually this is a really good opportunity that we stop potentially meddling in the housing market or offering free money or whatever we're doing a cheap money what do you think you would like to see prime minister boyce or housing minister boyce or even savings whatever you want to do the lessons to be learned from this that we don't go back to the old normals the old normals didn't work I think there is uh, this temptation from governments all the time to get quite meddly with the housing market, um, you know, in terms of schemes that have come out uh, in numerous forms uh, over decades, you know, to help to buy all of that kind of thing, which was built to help first time buyers sort of onto the market. But, you know, you could argue has helped sort of skew the market a bit. Um, things like the stamp duty flip flopping all the time you know one one year we've got stamp duty to pay another year we have a stamp duty holiday i think that gets all quite confusing then people i feel like sometimes try and time the market a bit uh, and i think that's a little bit what kind of happened uh in the pandemic um to try and give a, a sort of a boost up to the housing market and then what that did was just sort of blew the lid off house prices over a sort of 18 months to two years so all of those kind of things i've never been all that fond of the of the meddling that gets involved i think what most people would quite like to see in this country is enough homes being built that are of uh you know good quality and 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 you know what a good mix of stock as well at the moment i feel like we've gone into a real kind of phase of building quite like four or five bedroom homes we've got quite an aging population you know, there's an argument to be said there should probably be more sort of smaller one bed bungalows being built as a certain percentage um, of new build estates, for example. And also when these new build estates go up, that there's enough uh, infrastructure and facilities and that go in with it. I think there's a, it's a very, very complex, massive mixture. And that's just my small, quick thoughts as you landed it on me. Was that Sorry about that, Lee. Was that, was that philosophical it. enough? Splendid. Love it. Thank yeah. you. That's it for part one. 
I'm joined now by Sam North of eToro for our weekly look at what's been happening on the markets. Sam, just a quiet one this week, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been an interesting one to to say the least. The markets have sold off a fair bit now. Uh, however, I wouldn't be in panic mode to be honest. I think a fair few investors have actually been waiting for a dip for a while. Uh, give or take, we've had our five percent sell off uh, in the S and P five hundred. But historically, you know, we have two of these a year going back to the nineteen fifties. You know, it is worth remembering that it is normal. And we had a very, very good first half of the year. I think people would actually really like the idea of buying a little bit lower down. Reasons for the move lower, a hawkish pause from the Fed. The VIX is also now higher, trading above 16. Uh, this week, we also saw pauses from the SMB and the Bank of England. But that's hurt uh, the FX rates for those countries. Whilst on the face of it, it doesn't look the, the best week in the world. We are in the mid or the worst 10 day period of the stock markets historically. So it does feel like, you know, once we get through this, there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And the, the FTSE 100 has staged a bit of a rally, hasn't it, since August time? And it, it's now up, I'm looking at the numbers as we speak, 2.3% 2, 2 year to date. Do we think this pause from the Bank of England is going to put a little bit of rocket fuel under the, the UK market? Yeah, I think so. And I think the reason why we, we've been higher in, in the recent weeks is because we're sort of pricing in that, the end of the rate cycle. So hopefully, yeah, this is the start. I mean, it's got a long way to go to play catch up. Obviously outperformed a lot of other indices last year, unperformed the beginning of this year. But yeah, it feels like now is the time that it is going to start to recover. And what do we have to look forward to on the markets next week? Yeah, well, I mean, literally just like that, we enter the last full week of the quarter uh, and the month. Friday is the last trading day of both. Uh, and as always, it is worth mentioning how in the build up to that day, it can be quite tricky to navigate markets as the big players reallocate their funds ahead of the final quarter of the year. Other things to be aware of, um, we've got a government shutdown deadline uh, looming uh, on October 1st in the US. We've got European inflation, Chinese PMIs and the Fed's favoured inflation gauge, the PCE number next week. We've also got earnings from Nike, Castain and Micron Technology to wrap up, which is what's set to be a, a pretty interesting week. Yeah, there's a lot of eyes on this uh, economic data now, isn't there, to try and work out what happens next with rates after we've seen this pause. Exactly. It's the uh, the two words, data dependent. I'm sick of hearing it, but uh, that's what every central bank is saying now. Yeah, indeed. Sam, thank you very much. Uh, we'll speak to you next week. Thanks, Simon. Welcome back. It's been a bit of a bad week for climate activists. A rowing back on net zero and a delay to the petrol and diesel ban. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is making some... Bold moves, maybe. But are they the right ones? Don't worry, we won't philosophically go down that one. But uh, Simon, the car one, is that it for EVs? Is it, is it all over? Is this five year delay really just it's an end to it? Yeah, it was all, it was all the end for his new clothes. If you, if you were stupid enough to go out and buy an electric car more for you, you might as well sell it now quickly before it's lost all its value and it's completely worthless. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's like we're going back to yeah steam engines. In fact, yeah. probably get a steam awesome engine. Swap car, your electric I car think. for a steam engine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. So there's a couple of things going on here. In an in, interestingly, the the motor industry is not happy about the 2030 deadline being pushed backwards. The motor industry, for whom one of the reasons why the deadline is being pushed backwards is because they're saying the government's saying, well, look, we're not going to be ready for this and implying that the motor industry won't be ready for it. The motor industry is saying, look, we had a deadline. We quite liked working towards that deadline. i tell you why the motor industry liked the 2030 deadline as well, is because it gives people an incentive to go out and buy new cars and it gives them an extra nudge in trying to sell people new cars. So the switch to electric is quite good for the motor industry because people go out and they buy new cars. Oh, but... don't ever think that the Fords of this world are telling us that they're they're unhappy with these measures because they're doing it for the good of the planet. But it reminds me, Simon, of I asked you this a couple of years ago or something. And you said to me, I said, Is, are we ready infrastructurally, as it were, for for EVs? And you, and, and you said the car industry is going to be ready. The government wouldn't be. Look at you, Simon, you sage.
Well, the car industry is full of very, very innovative, very, very yeah. smart people, <laughs> and the government um, who are also exceptionally good at marketing and things like and selling and stuff like that. So the, the car industry, yeah, I didn't really worry about the car industry. The car industry plans quite a few years ahead, but it's it's not that difficult. And actually, you know, a lot of motor manufacturers, mainstream motor manufacturers, have massively upped their game on electric cars. There's a huge choice of brand new electric cars out there now that did not exist four years ago, for example, when your choices were, were much more limited. Charging infrastructure is a definite issue. If the take-up of electric cars was higher than it is now, um, and it's pretty high, about 18% of new cars being sold are electric, it, but if it was if it was to step up to the point where it looked like we might be on track to really smash our net zero targets then there would not be enough charging infrastructure um and there would be a problem most people charge at home who have electric cars but you've got the early adopters going on there who've been doing it for a while you've got the people who are interested like yeah actually i'm gonna go out and get an electric car And the people who are getting electric cars at the moment are more likely to be able to have a home charger. They're not only people who've got a home charger. There's lots of them living in London, major cities, you know, who have on street parking and they manage to do just fine. And there's some quite smart solutions to this chargers from lampposts and stuff like that. But it's it's considerably more cost effective and it's considerably more practical if you can charge from home. Most people don't actually drive long distances all the time. So most people are totally fine with an electric car. What you need is that when you do go drive a long distance, you are able to charge up at the other end before you drive back, for example, or you are able to stop halfway and charge up. And it is still considerably harder to do that than it is to fill your car up with petrol or diesel. But it's much, much easier than it used to be. And it's much, much quicker than it used to be. So we are on track, but the government has decided to row back on this because there are concerns about... Once it starts ratcheting up right towards that deadline, are we going to be ready? And I would argue in terms of infrastructure, the answer to that is no, we aren't going to be ready. Is the car industry going to be able to be selling people cars like that? Yes, I think it probably is. And I don't think many of the mainstream motor manufacturers would have been overly fussed if they couldn't sell new petrol and diesel cars after 2030. Because whilst they're still making new petrol and diesel cars, they're not putting that much effort into them and they were still going to be able to sell hybrids but what is really important and rob hull our motion Mm. editor picked this up and did a story on it yesterday is that actually there is a really crucial important part of this um switch to electric cars that is still in place and it's this zero emission vehicle mandate which basically says that manufacturers have to sell a larger and larger proportion of electric cars every year and if they don't do that they can be fined quite large amounts per car that they sell so they could be hit with a a heavy fine of up to fifteen thousand pounds for every new car that they sell and the way this ratchets up is projection for annuals zero emissions vehicle mandate targets 2024 22 percent of new car sales 2025 28 percent 2026 33 percent and so on by 2029, 66%, 2030, 80%, and then it keeps ratcheting up towards 2035. So obviously that deadline has dropped back, um, but this is still quite a hard target and um, will be costly if the manufacturers don't meet it. I shake my head, Simon, because I'm it just I'm exasperated in a way because when you look at read all the headlines about you know watering down these measures or or postponing dates etc as a consumer i'd be going oh do you know what then i was sort of thinking about buying an ev but i'm not going to bother now because if the government don't think the infrastructure is ready and you know we don't have to do it i won't bother and yet they say to manufacturers you have to keep producing that or we're going to fine you that doesn't make sense to me no i feel quite sorry for them can i say that you know there's an education point isn't there there needs to be something between the manufacturers making electric cars that people are not overly enamored with buying and the people buying them and the government and everybody learning a bit more about it and understanding you know how electric cars 
work? What are the charging issues? Do you need to have range anxiety? Will you be able to charge on the move? How much money will it actually cost you? And there's also the cost of them as well. That is that is the problem. Electric cars are more expensive. They are more expensive than their petrol or diesel equivalent by quite a lot of money. And that was glossed over slightly when they were holding their value very, very well, because most people buy new cars on finance. And in that instance, you're you're basically paying the cost of the depreciation. And if the depreciation over three years is quite low, then the monthly cost can be kept quite low down, even though the actual sticker price of the car is quite high. But unfortunately, electric cars have started depreciating much faster now. And that's making a big dent in the finance agreements that car companies can offer people which is also coming at the same time as interest rates have gone up so they're struggling to do those finance deals off the back of much higher interest rates than when interest rates were on the floor if you do want an electric Mm. car it's not a bad time to try and go buy one now because there's an oversupply of them and so you should be able to negotiate quite hard on the price much better than you could do two years ago and if you can get it through one of these company salary sacrifice schemes um, your work might offer one then that saves you the tax basically there's a very small benefit in kind payment and effectively it means high rate taxpayers can buy an electric car with 40 percent off those monthly payments so if you are in the market for an electric car not a bad time to buy definitely look into the salary sacrifice option sounds great simon but i still think the government needs to do some work on on its communication skills on this one right finally a reader email time this is not me We moved into a terrace property earlier this year and over the summer we were slightly bothered by the fact our garden is closely overlooked by our neighbours. Does that mean they've spotted the neighbours in the window spotting them? Or anyway, because you would have thought that they would know that before they moved in. But anyway, we're considering putting up a tall fence around the whole perimeter of our back garden to prevent this. But we've read stories of neighbours complaining to the council about fences like this, and this has us worried. What are we allowed to do? Do we need planning permission? Um, Lee, it's a good one for you. Furnish us with more details if you can. What, what's, what's this about? Antisocial neighbours? Hmm? Oh, neighbour wars, Georgie. Is there, is oh, there I love a, it. That, that gets us more kind of interested in reading the story than, than neighbour wars? I mean, mm. you know, we, we love to hate them. Um, yeah, we do. <laughs> neighbours or neighbour um, wars? <laughs> before I wade into this, actually, and I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast already, but um, I won't name who it is, but uh, someone who I know, um, the next door neighbours uh, had got permission to build a second house at the back of the garden. And it's not a massive, massive garden, mm. so don't get a, a vision of that. This is a huge, huge garden. Now, the kind of there was lots of um neighbors that sort of complained and said that they shouldn't have another home go up into this garden anyway they've been given planning permission i really can't understand why it makes absolutely no sense and the house that's being built as we speak backs on to the fence of of this garden and there's a there's a window that sort of overhangs that will overhang the garden so what the person whose house this is is going to do as soon as the house is built is basically going to put up like super massive trees uh, and we'll just block the light out of that window out of spite and that is the kind of nub of what neighbor wars is all about you know people are as i say we, we, we love to hate them you know it's kind of like you want to stay on the right side of your neighbors but also when they get on your nerves they get on your nerves um and it varies depending on where you are across the country and how many neighbors you've got but in this circumstance well, um, this reminds it, me yeah this particular case lee oh god I've, i'm having like trips down memory lane with old podcasts here at the moment but it reminds me years ago when you said you know if you're buying a house i quite like this tip you go you visit the house you almost sit outside and you stalk it you look at it at different times of the day and light and all sorts i can't believe you'd be getting into a house here and going oh hang on a minute the neighbors do you not just step out into the garden when you're taking a look at a new property and go oh look and they're looking at i mean the thing is with 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 modern life and modern britain and how lots of homes have been built is that inevitably you could see into other people's gardens but you know yeah. i could see into other people's gardens but am i am i standing at my bedroom window staring into binoculars my, yeah yeah staring into <laughs> neighbor's garden i can tell you fundamentally the answer is no because a i don't have time b i don't want to and c 
what what would I possibly be doing? But you know, we can't you, you can't brush everyone. You can't tell everyone with the same brush. You know, it's just it depends on what's going around. And that and that tip actually about kind of visiting at different times came from my father in law, who when we were buying a home, uh, my my now wife and I were living in London. And we were buying in Essex. We couldn't, you know, it was unrealistic for us to be coming and visiting the home that we'd put an offer in uh, and had accepted all the time. But without us asking, he would just give us regular updates. You know, it'd be like 7 a.m. It's like all quiet on the cul-de-sac. Like, OK, all right. And then it'd be like, oh, I'm just here at like half past nine at night. There's a bit of antisocial noise. And he'd be like, oh, my word, this has got quite a level of detail here. But I completely understood it because, you know, you might end up having a neighbour who's got like a workshop in a garage and that goes on and on and on. The noise, mm. the drilling, the, you know, the chainsawing or whatever on earth, not chainsawing, <laughs> you know, the, um, you know what I'm trying to say, the angle guide and all that kind of stuff. You know, you just you don't know sometimes it's such a big purchase. You don't know what you're getting yourself in for. And there's nothing worse than if you buy buy a home and then all you can hear is barking dogs and noise. And it's just, you know, a nightmare. A neighbor constantly having a party, music going on all the time. But look, we, we digress here. Let's go back to the to the question that was that was written into us. So um, th- these people, as you say, they've moved into a terrace property, which straight away makes me think, well, there's quite a lot of homes sort of packed in together. Uh, and we over the summer we were slightly bothered that the garden is closely overlooked by our neighbours I mean yeah I mean that's kind of you kind of knew it when you're moving in surely but I don't know the full circumstances we're considering putting up a tall fence around the whole perimeter of our back back garden to prevent this now when you say a tall fence I start having visions of almost like prison you know when you've got it so tall that you're basically going high and high and there's rules around that you can't just end up building a structure that's like incredibly incredibly high and blocks everyone out um the first thing to do is just to speak to your neighbors and just you know come up with try and have good neighborly kind of conversations and come up with potentially a solution that you all agree with sometimes that's easier said than done because you know you might rub your neighbors up the wrong way if you start accusing them of staring into your garden uh and this that and the other and then the next thing is about the planning permission so Usually fence is considered a permitted development, um, but there's usually height requirements. So you can't go above a certain height. And usually, actually, when you get the deeds of a home, I actually had to do this soon after we moved into to our place. We had to figure out whose side of the fence is whose because uh, there was a storm, fence blew down, had no idea which side of the fence is ours. And, you know, you can read the internet and it will tell you the matter of fact is always, you know, one side, but it's not necessarily always the case. So you'll, you'll need to check that out. But usually at the back, it's both your responsibility of you and the neighbours the, on the other side. Um, I don't think there's going to be many people that are going to want like a massive 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 fence i think you've just got to get a little bit more creative and a little bit more thinking about some you know tall trees and plants and things that you can get in there but again that's easier said than done you start banging up big trees they take absolutely ages uh to grow and they can cause all sorts of damage with roots so it's it's a it's a complicated one part of me percy thinks swallow it uh if you're really unhappy potentially move but i can't imagine what would upset me enough to have neighbors looking into my garden i just i can't do you really think your neighbors are just sort of looking and staring into your garden i don't know some people are more bothered about this than others though aren't they and and actually britain as a whole is a we we like our privacy in our garden we like our our garden to be our little spot some people just accept if they live in a built up area that their neighbours are going to be able to see in their garden. Some people are like, I really don't want them to be able to see my garden. I mean, they're not looking at you. They're not watching you. Um, you know, so it's usually absolutely fine. But it, you, when you are sat there and you can see people walking past and people do look, you know, it's like it's like having a TV in the corner of the pub, isn't it? People do. People do, It does catch their eye and, and they look and stuff. But Lee makes a really good point there. And the one thing I would say to people who buy a, a, a who move home move into a property or live in a property is don't underestimate the value and importance of mature planting trees hedges things like that and be very very careful before you chop them down 
And if you are thinking of chopping them down because you've decided that you don't want them there or you don't like them, go speak to your neighbours first. Ultimately, lots of people take the attitude, well, it's my garden and I'll do what I want. But Mm. this is a major, major source of neighbourly dispute. And you might have a neighbour who really does value their privacy in their garden and might get really quite upset if you take down that hedge or you take down that fence and replace it with something that people can just see through. So go speak to them. And people do value planting and hedges and trees and they're good for the environment and they're good for wildlife and all those other things. And they don't like it when people rip them down. Um, So, yeah, I've seen this time and time again in many instances of stories that we've had, people that I know, people who's, you know, complaining about their neighbours and stuff like that. And it's a major, major source of antagonism. And so, yeah, be careful before you rip out that bit of nature that somebody quite likes. Indeed. Right, that's it. You can keep up to date with all the latest breaking money news. Just go to thisismoney.co.uk or download the app. If you have any comments or questions for the team, any neighbours you would not like them to look into, uh, Simon. Yeah, shop your neighbours at editor of thisismoney.co.uk. <laughs> um, tweet your neighbours. Shame them on Twitter at thisismoney. Um, and uh, come to the reader comments and moan about them at thisismoney.co.uk forward slash podcast. We will find all podcast paths who can join in the debate, or just send us an email. Don't moan about your neighbours. Be no, nice to your Doesn't help. People. It's Indeed. the weekend. Be friendly. And if you like our podcast, why not rate us wherever you found us? It helps other people find us too. Don't forget, you can stay on top of what's going on in the markets by tuning in to the Digest and Invest podcast by Etora. Go to your regular podcast platform and listen on the go. Digest and Invest by Etora, the podcast for those interested in trading and investing.